if we take a look at chapter one, we're just going to kind of understand what the term really means. Take a look at it. So what is DSP? Well, actually, we're doing essentially digital. What happens is we're using discrete signals to represent, or represent data in the form of numbers. That's really what's going on. We have some sort of signal which has information in it, which is conveyed through the electronic circuit. Now, this signal could be simple sine waves. It could be a variety of different complex waves. We're going to take a look at that. And once we capture the data in the way we want, or and put data on it, we're going to be doing processing specifically on this in a way that uh, can solve different problems. It basically leads to the simple definition of digital signal processing. Changing or analyzing information which is measured in discrete sequence of numbers. This really uh, came about later. I mean, you didn't really have digital signal processing per se in the late 60s or 70s. We started doing more about it in the 80s. Okay? That's where it started to really take off. Now, just to show you an illustration of what we call an analog uh, recording, is this is supposed to represent tape. This is a microphone that's looking at some sort of information. It could be speech, it could be music, it could be anything of that nature. And there's a mic, uh, there's a basic an amplifier which takes this and boosts it up, and then it'll take and have recording ads which will record the information on tape. And then of the following here is essentially a receiving head. You'll pick up the information, you'll amplify it, you'll actually put it in the speaker, and you'll get the signal out. Now, the recording, analog recording, is this way. Now, this analog recording can be made on me different medias. Take a look at the original analog recorders, and they actually were a little wire. So it was a wire, not a tape recorder. And so you have an analog signal. But there are some problems that can't exist with analog recording. First of all, this tape can expand and collapse, can it? You don't get a total representation, unless you actually were in a particular environment where it was temperature controlled and it's pretty specific. So you'll get different variations of that. Also, what can happen? Do you have any ideas? Well, it could corrupt or have uh, voids in it. it. could have spots that won't record properly or transmit right. properly. A lot of material properties. Oxidation is basically, if you remember your tape basically has oxidation on it. And then you magnetize it, you demagnetize it, and after a short distance you wear out parts of it, things of that nature. So you don't get a very accurate perception of what really got recorded at the beginning. Just for instance, if you take a look at the audio recordings that were done in the past, and you say, well, they can't possibly be as good as digital. Now, there are people who argue that analog recording is better. I think it's the old standard saying, hey, we're going to bring back eight track recording. You know, it's better than anything else. We know it's not. And I believe a lot of times that falls into the same thing. Like, do you uh, use uh, records? I have in the past. It's not something I generally use on a day-to-day -day basis. But some people claim it's better. I don't know why they, they like, claim it. They like the sound better. They like the sound better. But there's no difference in the sound, frankly. What does happen, though, is when you have a needle going through the groove, you pop back and forth and wear and it'll make changes. <coughs> and a lot of times you can take an old recording and record it in, and anything it pops, you would do some sort of uh, mathematical analysis to smooth it out and get rid of it. We'll see an example of that as we go through here. And that shows you that situation. Now, the difference between an analog recording and digital recording is what we've got here is we've got effectively the signal is converted into numbers. By this, this represents that area. Numbers go into a computer. Numbers reside there, and then the numbers come out of the computer. And they're able to reduce the signal out by converting those digital numbers into an analog output. Now, whether you've got 100 degrees out there or 50 degrees out there, you're going to get the same numbers, aren't you? You should. You should get the same numbers, at least you will, but you should. And that way you can get the actual identical signal out as you got in. But this is that old story, you know. That I guess maybe the, whether analog is better than digital is like a four drink story or whatever it may be. Or discussion. It keeps getting used over and over again. Good excuse to have a drink, right? So what is the big advantage of DSP is you get repeatability. Things can be easily reproduced. Both for temperature, 
inverted numbers give uh, essentially unconditional stability. And digital signals can easily be duplicated from one to the other. But analog, if you take a look and get a, a particular on, on recordings with records, you get it pressed, and then it takes you to press another one. They go off a master. And every time you make a press, essentially one level, next level, next level, it's going to be modified. That's like old man Bose likes to do. I think, I think I mentioned that earlier. That uh, he would take and record music in, in the room, then replay it, then replay it again after you did like two, three recordings, and it was so modified you couldn't tell what it was doing. It made a bad case. Now, one thing about the actual data and the numbers, digital systems can be reprogrammed for all other kinds of applications. And what you'll see is you'll see some of the actual things that you can do with digital knowledge. And you actually can take these digital numbers and port them from one system to the other. Now, the numbers are numbers. Now, as far as the actual algorithms, they're the same algorithms, but the language may be different. So you have to do some sort of conversion effort, maybe to change it to another processor. But still, the data is exactly the same. Okay? BSP can allow large bandwidth signals to be sent over neural bandwidth channels. This is what we were talking about specifically with Shannon's theorem. The whole reason he looked into this is to be able to encode many messages on one set of wires. That's really what drove me to that issue. So the security also can be greatly improved because of the fact if you have an analog signal, almost anybody can interpret that, can't they? But if you take these numbers and they digitally encode them, and then no one else can actually interpret them unless they have the decoding purpose on them. I guess you're always using an Apple iPhone, right? <laughs> Make sure it's very secure. Now, the typical characteristics that you have is you have algorithms. You know what an algorithm is, Matt? It's a mathematical function. Could be. It's a set of instructions. What do you think it is, Jay? Generally, it's for us, it's a mathematical function that's been created in software. Right. It's basically what it is. So you can take this particular numbers, and you can have an algorithm that it can take and maybe convert it to another pattern would be the encryption aspect. There's an encryption algorithm. There's a decryption algorithm. There's a modulation algorithm. There's a demodulation algorithm. So the algorithms are the actual mathematical procedures to go through it. Sometimes you would like a very, very fast one. It works very effectively. Although it was kind of strange, which I've never seen before, but it makes a lot of sense, is my next door neighbor, son, worked for a company back out of Boston that they basically sold algorithms. That's all they did. And they develop an algorithm to be able to perform a function much faster, and that's all they did was sell algorithms to do certain tasks. The whole company. And then the characteristic also is you have to sample the data in some way. So you're going to end up with certain sample rates you can work with. And of course, clock rates, how fast that computer is going to run. And then, of course, you have different numeric representations. It has to do with coding and things of that nature with the, with the data. Example of some algorithms, speech coding and decoding. Okay. What would you use those? Digital cellular telephones, personal communication systems, digital cordless telephones, multimedia computers, sub secure communications. So these are different algorithms that will do this. And um, a lot of times you can buy them. Or sometimes you can use them if they're on the internet. Typically, the ones that are on the internet are not that efficient. Graph for being able to cram a lot of functionality in a very, very small time. Over the years, speech recognition has become very good, hasn't it? I mean, you all probably got to contact Google and ask questions, don't you, on your phone? Every day. Every day. I type it in, I don't say it. <laughs> a lot of people say it. It actually works pretty pretty effectively. Yeah, and I'll come back and tell you, hey, you typed in wrong. Come on, type it in. But uh, I saw one of the first speech recognition systems at Interstate. It was built out on a mini computer in that. And the cost of it 
is uh, $150,000. And that was considered cheap, literally. And then if you take a look today, you can go out and buy speech recognition software that's built right into what? Your word processor and everything else for probably 60, 70, 80 bucks. You can see how much difference that is and how it works out pretty well. So speech recognition is definitely done with your cell phones and your actual smartphones. Speech synthesis. Effectively, that's what they've used a lot. Where have you seen that? Well, the, when you talk, I make a call to some of you. They'll use synthesized speech to ask you if you want number one or number two, uh, how old are you, that kind of thing. And so every time you call to get service, you end up in, talking to a computer for the first, what, 10 minutes, basically. And then, so speech synthesis, multimedia PCs, advanced user interfaces, and robotics. Robotics is becoming more and more important, isn't it? What about driving a car? Supposedly they have driverless cars, right? So you want to go somewhere. You basically say, I want to go to 15th and 9th at this particular address. And then take that information, synthesize it, and then put all the commands in. It's all done through DSP processing. Now, now some of the modern algorithms that exist, they do the cellular phones, personal communication systems, Wordless phone, digital audio broadcast, digital signaling on cable, TV, multimedia computers, wireless computing, navigation. All these things are important as far as modern algorithms. Now remember I told you about that one company. All they did was develop algorithms. They had a fast algorithm that didn't use as much memory and did the job adequately. Then they sold lots of licenses. That's the whole purpose of it. Now one that you've probably experienced is noise cancellation, haven't you? You ever have a Bose noise cancellation headset? Any one of you? I don't have Bose. I've got uh, Sony. Have you ever used them, Jake? They're cheap. They're cheap. Actually, it turns out there's one little outfit that sold them for about 40 bucks. Actually, worked pretty well. They used a lot of these and uh, like orchestras and stuff like that. Then they didn't sell a lot of them, so they actually offered them for fifteen dollars. I bought four of them for fifteen dollars, and it really works very, very well. Now, noise cancellation, effectively, I put them on an airplane and cancel out the noise. The nice thing about using noise cancellation is that you can actually watch a movie at an appropriate level without jacking it up to full amplitude to be able yeah. to hear it. Works out pretty well that way. Yeah, I noticed that on long flights. Yes. Another situation is that they're using it in the Navy. The Navy actually will take a um, engine room and they'll sample the noise specifically in it and then they'll take and create noises 180 degrees out of phase. And now you've got a quiet engine room. So it's more difficult for someone to hear you in the water like a submarine or something of that nature. Very effective working on that. Um, Bose originally made their noise canceling headsets. They weren't electronic. They actually had little channels in the uh, phone that was in it, actually, and looking at certain frequency ranges. And they actually set it up so that when you heard it, it came another sound 180 degree out, not canceled. It wasn't electronic at all. And then they also have two different models of uh, their noise canceling headsets. I, I noticed that uh, at Costco, you can actually get uh, some from Sony, which are pretty easily caught. One thing I didn't like about the Sony is that, you know how you have a lot of air sounds in the aircraft? You've got the vents and things like that. It didn't cancel the air sound. It canceled other things, but the frequency is such it wouldn't cancel that out. So uh, essentially, uh, noise cancellation is very important, and it will become even more important trying to cut out engine sounds and things like that. And that's where you actually show out, measure it, and produce the sound 180 degrees out. Very important in Navy ships to keep them quiet. Sound synthesis, professional audio music, multimedia computers, and advanced user interface. Advanced user interface. And you can see that the cars that we'll have in the future 
They'll have a lot of voice commands, won't they? They will. They definitely will. Vision. Security, multimedia computers, and batch user interfaces, instrumentation, robotics, and navigation. You can pretty well figure out that robotics has to have some way of seeing things, right? So you use vision type algorithms and terminology, and you use DSP processors to do all our analysis of the data coming through. Okay. Also, you realize that they can now interconnect into the uh, optical nerve of the brain now, right? They did that recently, I believe, I'm not sure how long ago, just a couple of years ago or whatever. So you've all seen Star Trek Next Generation? Doherty? Remember? Where he actually used the visor to be able to see stuff? That's totally possible now with that, using DSP technology and actually taking interfacing in the optic nerve. Okay. So tremendous advances are happening. Now, you know, when you talk about cataracts, that's a little bit different. What's happened is your lens has basically gotten cloudy portions there. I'm talking really going into the optic nerve itself, which means somewhere in the future you might be able to take and even replace your eyeballs. Not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but maybe 10 years from now. Advances are making. And of course, images. Images. Look how many images you're basically taking on your phones now. The resolution has gone from very bad to extremely good, hasn't it? Extremely good. And then, of course, you have auxiliary chips of memory. You can plug in these darn things and keep all these images. And when you want to transmit this image from your phone, up to internet to a storage area, what you can do is you can actually take and get uh, compression and decompression. You want to compress it, transmit it, and then be able to bring it back and save a lot of time in your transmission. I don't think they're doing that much of compression now. There was one system, manufacturing system, that was put together where the terminals actually would display like work instructions. And let's say that you were working on an assembly line and you didn't know how to solder something or connect something. And you hit the button and what would happen is it would access a central database, then come down and display that. Well, what happens is that you have so much data, especially the images and that, that what you would need to take and store that data up in the main center after you've really compressed the data. And so these algorithms were designed to compress it so that you might have like one quarter of the time to bring the information down. And then it would come down and then the algorithm was such that it would decompress it. And, then, and there was a company that did that. It worked very effectively. There was a big push in the uh, 90s to get manufacturing back in the U.S. specifically. And so they were doing a lot of automated manufacture and workstation instructions and that. And so this company had developed the algorithms and techniques to be able to do that. That's all they sold. They did a very good, thing. good situation. Game forming. Have you ever worked with radar? How about you? Yeah. No, not directly, but um, we, we have had some uh, right. colleagues that worked with radar systems for. Well, uh, for instance, you know, on the early fire control systems, they had an antenna, it was a parabolic antenna. The antenna would sweep like this back and forth. And that would have the image of the cone would be able to sweep back and forth and detect like aircraft out in front of you or whatever it might be. Then, then they said, well, gee, uh, why don't we take, and rather than have a big parabolic antenna, why don't we take this flat plate and make it an antenna and sweep it? And simply somebody said, well, wait a minute, we don't have to take that physical plate and move it. We can take the physical plate, fix it, and then have algorithms that can change the phase relationships that create a moving beam from this fixed plate. And so you use that for beam forming and then also medical imaging. Anybody ever have an MRI? You've never had one. How about you, Jim? So I've had them. Very valuable thing. When I, before I had back surgery, an MRI was done on my back. The difference between MRI and X-ray. X-ray sees bones. An MRI looks at soft tissue to see how it's formed. So you can actually see the vertebrae, you can see the actual spinal cord and other things because of that. 
And I've heard that um, MRIs were actually discovered by accident. So it's, it's amazing how many things get discovered by accident, isn't it? Yeah. Now, so you, you need a lot of beam forming and image stuff and radars. Actually, you can get sonar signals of intelligence. We've seen how the actual echo cancellation works very well. But if you take a look at one of the speakers that Murr has in the room there, it's constructed such that it wants to cancel all of the echo sounds and other things off the room. So you hear just a pure nice tone. Those things used to cost quite a bit. Might be a thousand dollars for them. Now you can get them for a couple hundred bucks. That works out real well. And spectral estimation, signals, intelligence, and that kind of stuff. Done. So you can see the algorithms are nothing more than programs, but they have to run very, very, very fast. Now, a general purpose processor like you have in your uh, computers here are pretty fast, but a DSP processor is constructed entirely different from the architecture and also the actual instructions that it implements. And we'll go through those too. This is showing you some uh, characteristics of the DSP system. Right here, it's showing you a sample rates in kilohertz, showing you that you have ranges from extremely low sample rates to fairly high, 10 gigahertz. Over here, if you take a look here, it talks about the complexity of the algorithms, the roof software routines to fun through the functions you want, from very, not so much extremely detailed. Now you notice something here. If you take a look at weather, weather prediction and modeling, that the sample rates are fairly slow. This weather does change, but it's not that quick, is it? But then again, what happens is that the actual amount of computing time that you have to go through in using this data is going to take all kinds of time. And it wasn't until fairly recently that you were able to do weather predictions and keeping track. Now, if you go to Google and say, what's the weather in Las Vegas? It comes out pretty close. But when you go to your city, it's darn close. So a lot of this modeling has been done, which actually is done at the Weather Bureau and other aspects are accessing that data. So there's some very large machines that are doing the weather modeling and keeping it up. You also notice the sample rates for financial marketing are very slow. And it's hard to predict that. Because you, from what I've seen now, the financial marketing is such a way that the computers are causing control of the marketplace. Remember when there was about a thousand or two thousand drop in the Dow? In about a matter of what was it? Like ten minutes or something like that? And that was due to the machines. It really is due to the machines. Then as you go further along here, where you have less, you have instrumentation. So you can see the instrumentation, you know, your average value of this kind of stuff, really takes a lot less than you would for something like this. Seismic modeling. That's the sample basically very low. For instance, you have seismic sensors all over, right? You're able to project that. How about tsunami? Tsunami sensors can do that too. You can actually predict on that. And as we start getting up here, You'll see that up to speech and audio, radio modems and vo voice band modems, your sample rates get a lot higher and the complexity is from moderate to less. And then look at this, sample rates for video or high definition TV. It's even getting higher now, isn't it? On that. And radio signaling and uh, radar. So you can see that that's the, basically the characteristics of a DSP system. And without DSP, all you could do is add, subtract, multiply, and divide into a few plots. So if you take a look at the DSP system, which could be the software and or hardware, you will actually represent numbers a different way. The actual arithmetic operations that are done 90% of the time are addition and multiplication. And then you use a lot of times fixed point arithmetic versus floating point arithmetic. Use both. Now, have you ever worked with fixed point arithmetic? Have you ever done that before? Back in school or something yeah. like that? And what you're talking about is if you take and do that, the decimal point doesn't shift around, does it? 
everything lines up with the decimal. That's right. Everything is the right spot specifically. And the fixed point arithmetic is very fast compared to floating point. Floating point arithmetic can take 10 times, 100 times faster and slower than fixed point arithmetic. It really is that in that category. 